Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's time to take global stories making headlines in our national dailies. And joining me to review the papers is Professor Kamilu Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, joining us from Kanu. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Good morning. All right, so we'll get straight into the papers. And I think um, since you're joining us from Kanu, it's only right that we take this story as the first one. So we'll be starting with Daily Trust this morning. And Daily Trust, um, you know, leads with Emirates Tussle. It says, protesters hit Kanu streets, demand Bayero's return. And then the writers on this one says, commissioners, local government chairs on solidarity visits to Sanusi. Another says, don't destabilize Kanu, opposition lawmakers tell federal government. And then, uh, I've accepted my faith, my faith, that is being said by dethroned em emir of Gaia. And finally, we've uncovered plot to attack state assembly, others, that is being said by the police. So there's a lot going on in Kanu right now, from the commissioners, from some people rather, being, you know, happy with the fact that Sanusi has been reinstated as the Emir of Kanu, and obviously you're seeing commissioners, local government chairmen, um, you know, going on solidarity visit to them. Whilst, you know, some other people are not happy about it, and some opposition lawmakers have said, do not destabilize, you know, Kanu. The Emirs have said, you know, well, we've accepted our faith because now they're being deposed as, you know, Sanusi has been reinstated. And then there are some attacks. So please just walk us through what's going on in Kanu. We've seen footage, some footage that, you know, people are holding placards, people are protesting um, in regards to this. But I just want you to, like, let us know, bring us up to speed on what's happening in Kanu right now since you're there. Okay. Um, Kanu is tensed um, as a result of uh, the decision uh, to remove the former... I mean to remove uh, the uh, the gov uh, the Kano is tense as a result of uh, the decision now to uh, change or to change the Emirates system uh, policy that was uh, uh, embarked upon since 2019, and um, this is an offshoot of the political conflict between the two uh, major. Uh, contestant, I mean, between the two major uh, power tussle. Um, it is between Konkoso and the Ganduji. Now, what happened was, uh, you know, Ganduji, as a result of uh, his conflict with uh, uh, Konkoso, decided and they enacted, you know, uh, the Emirate uh, uh, law, which uh, balkanized the Emirates system here in Kano into five, and also, uh, you know, the throne uh, Sanusi. And now, since Kongposo is not in power, but it is a uh, protege that is in power, they uh, have taken decision to reverse it. And this has set uh, Kano into a uh, problem. Actually, what is happening is that all what you have mentioned there are other protests, there are other things that are silent in other places, like in Karae and so on, people writing petition that they are against uh, the new law. So I think it is wider than that. And uh, what uh, added to the confusion is the you know, injection uh, that uh, the, uh, the court passed that uh, they should state, um, uh, there should be status quo ante. That is to say, uh, Sunusi should not be reinstated, and uh, whatever happens, the law should. I mean, uh, the governor and the legislature should wait until uh, the court decide. But uh, the governor went ahead, and uh, they reinstated, uh, you know, Sunusi, and in fact, even they personally took him to. Uh, the Emma's palace, mm. and uh, they are giving him protection with uh, political thugs and other things. So, and the police that uh, he requested to arrest the former Emma, as we can call him by his own uh, decision, um, said they are going to abide by the court ruling. So that is why Kano is tense that had it been the police obeyed what. Uh, the governor issued 
the former uh, 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 Sarki, that is King, will have been in police uh, net by now. But that will also create uh, create another problem. So th this is where we are now, and um, the state government is contemplating if the thing continues, perhaps we are going to see a uh, state of, uh, not state of emergency, but a curfew is likely going to be imposed because of the situation that is gradually, uh, you know, growing up in can. Mm. So with all of this um, going on, do you think there is going to be, you know, some part or so, one, that would make Sanusi be deposed again? Is that is there even that possibility? And all of the other emirs, because I understand that, um, you know, the fact that all of those other emirs are being removed, now is back to a one central, um, you know, consulate, if I can use that word, with Sanusi being the one for central. So if they, is there a possibility whereby they're going to break all of this again? Maybe Sanusi stays as, you know, the main um, center of it all with some other sub-emirs or Sanusi being taken out and then all of them being reinstated again? You see, this all depends on the court because already the thing now is before the court. And, uh, you know, whatever the outcome of the court ruling is what is likely going to prevail or what is definitely going to uh, prevail. As things are, we, the, the tense situation is high, but I mean the tension is high, but uh, the fact is that um, unless the court rules uh, either for or against, one cannot certainly say who is going to be the... Emma, uh, as at now, you see the government uh, are back in Sunusi, and the court say that uh, they, they, by their own rule, when they say, I mean, a, a judgment that uh, a, they should state um, things should remain as they are, uh, then it is uh, Bayero who is legally the uh, the Emma. So court by their own ruling until you know we go to the until uh, it finalizes the whole process is uh as uh, ado bayero i mean ado bayero who is uh, uh the aim uh, but by the law passed by the assembly it is Sunusi. so literally we are having two emas now mm. uh, each one claiming uh, the position but like i said who will eventually be the emir will depend on the law and it will depend on the court ruling. Mm. Okay, so staying in, um, you know, northern Nigeria, there's another one here on the Daily Trust that talks about, um, you know, statement from the Sultan of Shukoto. So he says, we cannot educate our children by leaving them begging, so begging on the streets. Now, we know that the governor of Zamfara, you know, has created a, a Quranic school or a Quranic educational center, and he has said, you know, he's up for the future of the kids. So all of the Almajiri kids, um, this is an Almajiri integrated um, Quranic educational center. And so the, the, the Sultan of Sokoto has said, if we want to educate them, you know, we cannot leave them begging on the street. What other measures do you think? Because you hear of, you know, in fact, Nigeria has one of, we're top when it comes to out of school children. And then when you go to Northern Nigeria, you're seeing most of these kids who are supposed to be in schools, but they are on the streets begging. They're on the streets, you know, doing all kinds of menial jobs as well. As young as five, seven year olds, they're already trying to hustle their way, you know, in life. And these are kids who are supposed to be in school, who are supposed to be studying, who are supposed to be looking, you know, at a brighter future for themselves. So what can we do, you know, as a government? Aside, you know, this educational center that the, the governor of Zamfara has, you know, inaugurated now, but all the... Um, states in northern Nigeria, how can we start to put our hands together to educate our kids? Yeah. So what I'm saying about this al issue, mm. um, actually it's an indication of the failure of the government and the elite. It is, uh, this system has been uh, on for quite some time, and some of them attach a kind of cultural uh, belief to it. But, uh, you know, the successive governments seem to ignore it, 
Okay, and they don't uh, mind what happened until it reach uh, this kind of uh, this level. So, had it been, you know, the issue of poverty, the issue of uh, you know education uh, addressed right at the grassroots level, that uh, the Almajiri problem will not be where it is now. But the fact that uh, the government, successive government, uh, didn't give my you know consideration to it, they don't care about it. And they leave it until, you know, people are rushing into their cities. And the mm. other thing is, uh, government seem to neglect rural areas, okay? The, everything is concentrated in the urban areas. So that is why there is massive uh, migration from rural areas to urban areas. No, because what we are seeing these young ones are just element but the whole thing is from young ones to old ones they are all migrating into cities because urban uh, rural areas are literally deserted by the people so that is why i say it's a failure of the government you see in the 60s and in 70s we had the almajiri uh, problem but it wasn't like this mm. the fact was that uh, the government then tried to integrate uh, Western education with uh, Islamic education, okay? So there was no much difference between the two. There was this major. So that is why even people in the rural area don't migrate a mass as they used to because in search of education, they will get But now we divorce it, we leave it, and the system is such that um, the government doesn't support, except for politicking, when they come and say they establish al majri system, there is nothing that is done. And uh, the people, the teachers who bring the pupils into towns, into cities, they are left on their own. There is no salary, no any uh, even accommodation for them. And the children, you know, when they come, they do nothing, but they will now try to get uh, education and they will depend, uh, depend for themselves. So that is why we see it. We see them all uh, roaming in the streets trying to make and meet all right um i i hope that you know they're putting this in place in the sense that you know we always say our kids are the leaders of tomorrow and if we want a better tomorrow if we want a better nigeria then we need to start to invest in education today so the investment that we make today determines what the future will be like tomorrow and these children are imperative to move nigeria forward um, so it's it's important that we look at this, we invest in education. So you've said that in the 60s, you know, we had that issue. So I'm wondering how they were able to tackle it and, you know, it coming back again. Maybe they did not do a very good job. So it's important that now they do an even better job to ensure that these kids are, they, they, they should be in school. They did not ask to be here and you cannot fend for them properly. So they should be in school. They should have quality education, good health care. They should have good welfare, total welfare packages. I think um, that, that's, that's just what I can use to sum it up. Okay, so let's move to yeah, let, let, me, let me add something before we go. You see, okay. upon the formal Western education here in the North, uh, the, the, the leaders don't uh, uh, care about it. It's just, uh, they say, pre-education, pre-education, pre of nothing. If you come to this place, you go to rural areas, even in urban areas, you see that the schools are so dilapidated. Only they are avenue of corruption. So that is why, since the government is not serious, and uh, the leaders are not serious about education, whether Western or uh, Islamic, that is why we are having this problem. Mm. Well, I hope that they, they, they just look at it and try to tackle it in depth. And then, you know, that would definitely be amazing. All right, um, let's move over to another story still on the Daily Trust because President Tinubu is almost a year in office. In fact, in two days, it will be one year of the President Bola Ahmed Tinubu's administration. And so former President Olusegun Obasanjo has said Tinubu's policies are necessary but wrongly implemented. So we've seen certain policies where in two days' time, <laughs> the first statement when the president assumed office was subsidy is gone. Uh, 
Another one was, you know, electricity tariff. Another one is women have to increase taxation. Another one is, you know, cybersecurity levy, which has been suspended. And I don't know what that means, whether it's been taken out completely or just suspended. And then in a few weeks, months, years, we'll bring it back. So you're seeing all of these policies happening. But president, um, former President Olusha Gobasan just said, you know, they are necessary, but wrongly implemented. Would you agree with this statement? Yes, I, I agree with uh, Obasanjo 100%. Um, if you get his, uh, the detail in the Vanguard, he mentioned uh, the reasons. He said that the government has so far taken many policies, but uh, he cited three major ones, and he said they are all wrongly uh, taken. Uh, the issue of subsidy removal and uh, the issue of, uh, you know, allow Naira to buy its value and the issue of Niger. Niger. So he said these are major policies, but the government, you know, mishandled them. Because what you are saying that economy doesn't, uh, you know, obey orders. It uh, looks for uh, you know, concrete plan and direction you have to do it. And what he said is that uh, the government should have listened and should have looked at uh, what is happening. Because by now, when the government issued these uh, new policies, he said many companies, many industries, many uh, multinationals are leaving Nigeria. He even cited the example of Total. He said Total, uh, you know, is investing $6 billion in Angola uh, while they are migrating from Nigeria. He said this is what the government should look at. They should not be deceiving themselves that they are on the right track, uh, things are happening. So if there are these things, we are likely going to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. Well, hopefully we see the light at the end of the tunnel because the government has come out to say, oh, you know what, we need to make sacrifices. These sacrifices will in turn, um, you know, be better for Nigeria. But then I'm wondering how are the government, how is the government itself making sacrifices? Because I, I want to believe you need to be able to cut the cost of governance. That would obviously help. I know that the president has said, you know, he's having a low-key celebration. I don't know if that's his way of, you know, cutting costs. But one year in office and, you know, having several policies, I'm wondering how these policies actually, um, you know, impact the lives. Making sacrifices that's fine. But if we are going to make sacrifices, then we need to make sacrifices all around, not just for the poor masses. Because you're still hearing of people stealing billions. You're still hearing of, you know, even politicians requesting for SUVs, 160 million naira. You're still hearing of so many things going on and you're wondering, you are there to serve. You are there to be a leader. You're there to help because Nigeria is dwindling. We're d dwindling into a uh, into a ditch, a very big ditch. And then there is some sort of cavalier attitude whereby most of them don't even care. So having to bring all of these policies is great, but then how does that impact the lives of Nigerians? And I think that's the question. So before you put out any policy, you need to understand that let's do the SWOT analysis of this. Is this going to impact the lives positively? If yes, and then there's a majority, why not? But then having to tax people so much with the little that they have, that means you're just asking for maybe their blood or something because at what, what, at what point are they going to break? If you push a man to the wall, at some point he's going to break. So I don't know with these policies, um, you know, your own take on maybe how they should have gone about it. For instance, fuel subsidy, they said they were servicing some cabals and they needed to stop that. Isn't there another way that they could have gone about it? Meanwhile, the Nigerian citizens still have this product to buy at an affordable rate and then, you know, try to take out the cabal. So all of these policies that, you know, the President Bola and Tinubu's administration have put, do you think there are other ways we could have gone about it? Oh, yes, there are a lot of ways. Um, you see, let's to remain on what Obasanjo said. You see, Obasanjo said that what we need is a long-term plan. He proposed a 25-year uh, plan that uh, he, he said the government should concentrate on about six areas. One, he talked of on education first, 
Then he said the, the second one is on uh, uh, food security, and the third one is on energy. These are areas where if the government is serious and they face uh, uh, this, uh, they will be able to, you know, uh, deliver what uh, the, the mandate is all about. But the way we are, you know, he, he, he put everything squarely on leadership. And, uh, you know, when the leadership is calling that uh, people should, should sacrifice, I think they are the past to uh, show uh, the level of sacrifice, like, like you said. Yeah. You cannot expect the government saying that there is economic problem, there is this, and yet uh, it is, uh, you know, running such an expensive government, okay, so huge. Look at the ministers, uh, 40-something, and then look at uh, the, the cost of governance that uh, you have, unnecessarily buying the vehicles, like uh, uh, expensive, luxurious uh, you know, uh, motors for the, the uh, uh, legislators, and so on. So that was what Obasanjo was saying. That is why I said I agree with him 100%. What we need is a plan. And uh, this long-term plan is not just to have it on paper, but we take the necessary step uh, to, uh, you know, uh, actualize it. The way we are now is just in just two days, um, the government will be uh, one, uh, one year in office. Already, you know, the president said uh, minister should give account of mm. what is uh, what uh, they have been doing for the last uh, one year even though this is not up to one year you know they were sworn in uh, in august but we are talking of the same government so i think what we are likely going to see is a mutual admiration uh, society each one will come out and say they have done this, they will glorify. Already, if you look at the papers like yesterday, uh, the Sunday papers, some are saying uh, the government is giving itself a 70 percent, uh, uh, you know, the achievement. So I think this is not what we, we need. What we need is this is a democratic government. Who are the people to assess it? It is the people. Okay, the people are already crying about uh, these policies, and the government refused to uh, take into consideration this. They will come out uh, if nothing happens uh, on, uh, you know, in two days, and they will now beat their chest and pat themselves on the back and say that they have done well. And uh, like I said, already they have scored uh, themselves 70%. And the other thing is, uh, what Oba Sanjo said is true, but I think from what uh, the spokesperson of the government said, I don't think the government will consider anything that Obasanjo said, because they say it is his own private opinion, the personal opinion, and he's entitled to it. You see, what the government ought to do is to listen, to yeah. listen to the people, to listen to leaders and so on, opinions, if they are constructive, take into consideration and adjust. But when you start denying, you live in denial. I think we are not going to go anywhere. I totally agree with you because you, you, it's, it's democracy is supposed to be, you know, a government for the people, um, by the people. So it's a people's led administration. That's how it's supposed to be. If we're saying we're, you know, practicing, you know, the true form of genuine democracy. So it's important that you listen to people. You cannot say, oh, well, we're practicing democracy and you know, whatever I want to do, that is just an autocratic system of government. And I don't think that's what Nigeria should be practicing. Listen to the people, whatever, you know, opinions that other people have, listen to it and see how can we, you know, tweak this, you know, just tweak it in a way that it will benefit us, benefits, you know, the whole of Nigeria. All right, moving over to another paper, let's move over to the punch. The punch leads with coastal highway will boost 30 million businesses. Um, that is being said by President Tinubu. And the writers here says, um, President says project will foster trade, tourism, seek counterpart funding. Tinubu insists landowners will get compensation. Um, 700 kilometer highway of a symbol, or highway is a symbol of unity. Um, is also on some other papers as well. So this coastal highway boosting, you know, 30 million businesses. 
I know there are lots of businesses right now that have been demolished where people are not even happy about this. Um, last week, we also heard about some realignment of this coastal highway, um, I think from kilometer 16 to 40 something, up to 47 thereabouts. Um, you know, different things are coming every day. There was even a point that the reps are having to probe, probe this project as well. But here we are today because it's every day, it's like a developing story. Here we are today, President Tinubu is saying Coastal Highway will boost about 30 million businesses, regardless of the few businesses that have had to be demolished about this. But do you think, you know, this might just be um, some wishful thinking? Is it possible that 30 million businesses will actually be boosted with this Coastal Highway? Is it a good enough price to pay for the future in the sense that there are people, I mean, I've heard people come to me and have conversations about this, saying this road isn't what we need at the moment. There are people who are just trying to survive. There are people who are just trying to get their head above water. And so the government is supposed to be looking for policies that would help all of that instead of this coastal highway. And now, if we're saying that we want a road network, or we're saying we want a network of transportation, why not have a railway instead of a road? We have roads already most of which are not even properly maintained. So a railway would probably be better because you can have cargoes, you can have, you know, lots of things moving across states. We do not really have something like this in Nigeria. But I want to get your take. What do you think about this? The coastal highway, the fact that it's going to boost about 30 million businesses in when it's being completed. And should it have been the right, um, the right kind of infrastructure for Nigeria at this time? I, I think this is one, it is a, a wishful thinking that uh, it is going to impact uh, 30 million business. I, I don't think that is uh, uh, realistic. Okay. Um, secondly, uh, it is part of what you have said earlier on that uh, this ought to have been, uh, you know, a democratic government to listen to what the people are saying. Uh, one, if you look at it now all over the world, it is not the bulk, but this is what the countries, developed countries and developing countries are doing rail system because it is the, the most efficient, uh, it is, uh, you know, most durable, and it is the cheapest means by which you can haul ha such huge uh, load within a short uh, period. So they are now looking at that one, and we are going back to road. By the time uh, this one is done, even though the minister said they are going to use concrete base, I believe in the next five years it will be looking for maintenance. But if it is a railway, you know, it's going to be for long before you have this thing. So instead of the government to look at that direction, uh, since they have made up their mind, this is what they want. That is why we are having problems. Already the legislature is uh, saying they are going to prove it. People who are from, uh, whose profit have been demolished are complaining that uh, the, the repayment this thing is uh, very low so there are cues and cries left and right and center and besides even when the president was uh, flagging off the scene he said he is also flagging of 330 you know roads and bridges to be uh, repaired so already we have the dilapidated uh, roads and others look at what is happening so and uh, look at the area it is a you know a swampy area it is a rainy area i mean an area that roads even if you have concrete with a base they are not going to last forever because of the nature of the area has it been they concentrate on rail uh, transportation yeah. uh, this is going to be better for the country and they are going to achieve the same result and it is going to be a long-term uh, solution to the problem and the side dimension of the problem is that if you now take this is about uh, 700 kilometers what they are saying and look at what uh, they have earmarked for it and compare it with what is happening in other places like the uh, the road that is going to lead from Cairo to Johannesburg in South Africa is about, uh, I think, uh, five times longer than this. And it is about one-tenth of how much it is going to cost to build these 700 kilometers. So I think this is uh, 
uh, it's a done deal because the government has already uh, said they are going to do it and they have even started it. But actually, I even it is a real democratic system. Before they do, they have to listen to the people and they look at uh, the cost benefit of doing it and look at uh, better alternatives. Look at uh, countries like Ethiopia now, they have put, put their, their name in the world map in terms of railway, in terms of airline, and we are still going to the same issue of road construction, road construction, which is an old system, which is uh, you know a waste of resources uh, compared to uh, a rail system. A uh, road system is a short uh, range thing. And like I said, in the next few years, you now have to think a lot of money in terms of maintaining it. And these businesses that the government is saying, they are just hoping, they are just trying to justify that it is worth the venture. All right, let's move over to The Guardian. Um, the Guardian leads with firms and Jenko's in fresh crisis over el eligible customer policy review. Now, this policy review, if implemented, you know, we throw um, over 15 medium-sized manufacturing companies who were granted the approval to bypass Nigerian bulk electricity trading PLC and the distribution companies disclosed and, and the struggling power plants um, into some crisis whereby, you know, they're going to reduce the excessive monopoly and transition, you know, of this uh, with a bilateral market. What do you think about this? Because it's a, it's a lower band for the producers school's eligibility and you know right now there's just some level of crisis between both the genco's and the firms as well with this policy review i want to get your comment please you see what the genco's are doing is literally that agile they are being uh, penny wise and pound foolish mm. by the time they revisit this policy which after all it has not been long i think it was the previous government that uh, it made the policies. Uh, by the time they do it, what will happen is that uh, generation, uh, energy generation will be very high, cost of it will be very high. And at the end of it is that it is not uh, these small and medium uh, industries that are going to be affected alone. Uh, we are likely going to see a problem of unemployment because if it is too high, they have to retrench people. And then we are back to the problem, socioeconomic problem of unemployment. And their productivity will go down. So I think what the Jankos and what the government ought to do is like what I said earlier on. Let them do cost-benefit analysis. Now they think they are going to raise the thing from, by, you know, these manufacturers. And they pass it on. Yes, the manufacturers, some of them will have to wind up. Some of them who try to survive will have to raise their costs and they will have to cut uh, employment. So I think that eventually, uh, like I said, it is going to be penny wise and pound foolish policy. Mm. All right, so moving over to our final paper, which is the business NG. Um, it's not the headline, but I'd like to take this. It talks about food prices and it says food prices skyrocket by 130% in nigeria what do you think about this it's every day you're hearing of inflation every single day the inflation that we had in Fe in february is not the same that we have in may and in fact now we're entering june so we'll probably see a new rate but with the fact that food prices food that is supposed to be a basic necessity for everyone because you need food to be able to live and survive Every single day you go to the market, it is never the same price. In fact, yesterday's price is not today's price, as some people would say it. But 130% in Nigeria right now, Nigeria, where we have fertile lands for agriculture, aside the fact that obviously insecurity plays a major role whereby some farmers cannot go to the farms. But why is the government not doing, you know, certain things to ensure that we have better food or we have food, you know, food supply? overflowing in Nigeria instead of this crisis and where I was seeing inflation or I was seeing the prices soar as high as 130 percent what do you think about this it feels like the government might just be sleeping on us and they're not putting proper measures in place you see the, the issue of uh, food insecurity is a very dangerous thing uh, many people have said it, it is a cake, like we are sitting on a cake of grandfather. It's a, it's a time bomb, you know, because once people 
you know, cannot eat. You push them to the to the world with uh, hunger and poverty. They, nobody knows what will happen. But you see, the government keeps on denying the fact that the whole source of this problem are the pro the policies that the government, uh, uh, you know, uh, roll out were on the very day that uh, it was sworn in. That is the removal of the subsidy. That is the value of the Naira. And now there is also problem of uh, insecurity. Unless the government address this, I think whatever they are going to do is just they are going to address the symptom, not the real uh, problem. And uh, that is why, you know, I will go back again to what Obasanjo said. He mentioned these things in uh, his speech. What the government ought to do, we have said it, listen to the people. The people are crying. And this is these are the cause of it. Why can't you address it, you know? Yeah, what happened is that uh, in the last one year, we have seen this problem of ins uh, uh, food insecurity, you know, growing at a such exponential rate. Because uh, today, if you buy something uh, in terms of food, uh, you, anything, but if you buy, uh, buy it in the morning, by the time you go in the evening, it is uh, likely going to be higher. Mm. Imagine a situation where just a cup of uh, gari now is about 250 or something. What can a person, an uh, ordinary person, eat? He cannot, even a loaf of bread, you cannot afford it. And at the same time, the government, knowing fully what this, is also denying the fact that, uh, you know, I, I will attach, even though you didn't put it, the issue of the minimum wage, they are saying, uh, how can you have all these things and you expect people to live uh, uh, comfortable, not even comfortably to survive? That is why, you see, many people, uh, as the report said, uh, about 70% are now having multidimensional uh, poverty uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, poverty, hunger, and so on. So I think it's high time for the government to come out, especially especially now that uh, it will be in office uh, in the for one year in the next two days. So let this uh, celebration be a position or a time for rethinking. Let the government comes out and say, okay, we have done this and we know it is a problem. So we, re we are reviewing it and they take measures. But uh, like I say, what you are going to see is the government will come up and beat it say that it is on course. And this is the problem that uh, is going to continue. Mm. Well, we hope that, you know, they understand the fact that people need food. And as a government, your utmost priority, priority is to ensure the welfare of your citizens. And when we're talking about welfare, obviously we're talking about food, we're talking about security, we're talking about healthcare, and we're talking about housing. So this entire makeup is, you know, the welfare of the citizens. So if you do not have that in place, then you're probably failing as a government. So we hope that they know it is imperative that they start to put measures and policies in place that would aid the welfare of the people. And hopefully someday, sometime soon, um, we start to see the dividends of all our sacrifices that we've made in the past one year. All right, this is where we have to wrap it up on this segment. Dr. Professor Kamili, we want to say thank you for coming. It's always a pleasure reviewing the papers with you. Thank you very much. All right. We've been speaking with Professor Kamili Sani Fage. He's from the Department of Political Science by Yero University, joining us from Kano. And we're just taking um, global stories making headlines in our national dailies. We'll go on a short break, and when we return, we'll be looking at our first hot topic. This one talks about Sarah asking Tinubu to declare assets. Please stay with us. <laughs>